happy Wednesday, uh, Baylor College of Medicine and friends of Baylor College of Medicine. I have to remember it's Wednesday because we usually do this on Fridays. Uh, day before Thanksgiving, we wanted to be sure we got all the information to you in time for your special Thanksgiving treat. I am personally in, uh, in North Carolina. I followed the Jim McDevitt McBubble, uh, and we had one kid, uh, Alex, who was in uh, New York. He quarantined for four days. He got his PCR test. He's quarantined for another four days. Just to be safe, we got him another PCR test, and he's okay. So, but it's, it's what you gotta do, and it's just our immediate nuclear family, no one else coming. We're following what Jim McDevitt said we should do. Anyway, what I thought, uh, you know, over the last several months, people write in questions all the time, all the time. And I, I try to answer as many as I can during the regular uh, videos, but you know, they accumulate. And so what I thought I would do today uh, is just take on a lot of your questions. But before I do that, I want to do a giant shout out uh, to Daniel Pan at Annunciation Orthodox School. Uh, he sent the nicest thank you note to, to me uh, and to the college. Uh, thanking the college for all we do around healthcare. So I'm so delighted, uh, Daniel, that you wrote us. The whole college is excited about that. And thank you very much for thinking about us uh, during this holiday season. So big shout out to you. So we got a bunch of questions. Uh, now remember, this is, I have to do a disclaimer. Uh, I do not represent the United States of America. I, I only represent Baylor College of Medicine and uh, and my own opinions on this is based on the best data I can, uh, I can look at. I'll try and answer these as best I can. Um, yeah, I will answer these uh, as best I can. So uh, one person asked, uh, based on one of, the, one of the things we talked about, was masks, do they actually protect you? I mentioned it and they said, really? Do they really protect you? Well, there's some really good science came out of England where they looked at particles coming towards you uh, and various masks. And if you have a cloth mask, a uh, regular cloth mask or bandana, it will cut down about half the virions that are coming at you through aerosolization. It, it blocks, it drops, but it, the aerosols are, are the issue. If you wear a surgical mask, it cuts it down by about 25%. And if the person is wearing a mask and you're wearing a mask, it cuts it down by the you know, four by four, so it's like 16 fold. So it really is incredibly effective when everyone's wearing a mask. But if you just wear a mask because you don't want to get sick, that's perfectly reasonable. And there's plenty of evidence it cuts down significantly in the amount of aerosolized virus that you will be exposed to. So wear a mask to protect yourself. You know, forget everybody else, just do it for yourself. That's, that's one very important thing. So one person asked, if I do get vaccinated, will I have to continue to wear a mask? Well. Good question. Uh, normally, I'd say yes, and, and I think the answer is going to be yes because uh, they're not 100% effective. They're, even if they're 90% effective, that means one in 10 chance you, will, you might get it anyway. So I think until there's a broader distribution of, of vaccines to the public, I, I would wear a mask. When I get vaccinated, I'm going to wear a mask until there's 60 to 70% of the population is uh, has been vaccinated and we're actually at herd immunity. Uh, there's another question. I have concern about the safety of the COVID vaccine. Uh, when does it come out and how safe will it be? Well, the safety data is, is usually two months after the close of the phase three trial. So that's when it will get official approval. They're giving an emergency, the, the two uh, genetic uh, vaccines, the RNA vaccines will get emergency use approval a little bit before all of the safety data is in, but it will be in very shortly before it's distributed. So I feel, feel very comfortable. There's been very little complications uh, from this vaccine. We'll know more uh, obviously when thousands and hundreds of thousands of people are vaccinated, but at least in the clinical trial safety data, they look perfectly safe. And I'll be the first one in line, first one in line uh, to get a vaccine. And how will it be decided who gets the vaccine first? So there was a very good publication that came out from uh, the National Academy of Medicine. That doesn't mean that they will follow that. The CDC guideline, guidelines will be what really uh, uh, determines who will get it first. But it was a very thoughtful thing from the National Academy, Academy of Medicine looking at uh, the first 5% will be probably frontline healthcare workers in hospitals, nursing homes, or those that are providing uh, direct patient care. 
uh, and those who work in, the, in, in that kind of thing, like environmental services or, or transportation, or people who are exposed to aerosols all the time, and that's only 5% of the population. The next thing will be uh, those with underlying uh, conditions like heart disease, sickle cell disease, cancer, obesity, uh, diabetes, things like that. And that'll cover another 10%. Hopefully, by the second quarter, there'll be enough vaccines to go into phase two. And that will be really, uh, I would say, teachers, uh, school staff, ch uh, child care workers, uh, people who are in high risk settings, uh, homeless shelters, things like that. And then the, the phase three uh, will be, and that's about uh, uh, 30 to 35 percent of the population. Uh, phase three will be 40 to 45 percent of the population. That'll be uh, young adults and workers in industries like colleges, universities, hotels, banks, exercise facilities, uh, and then the rest of the country. So there is a plan, at least, that the National Academy of Medicine has put out, and we'll see what the CDC says, but I think it'll be pretty close to the same. The actual vaccine is initially going to go to hospitals and, and, and doctors uh, who are able to provide it, and they will follow those guidelines. So there may be some variability, but based on the guidelines, that's, what, uh, that's where it will go. And because of the unique uh, storage responsibilities for the uh, requirements, storage requirements for the RNA vaccines, they're not everybody who's going to be able to do it. There'll be certain centers where you can have a thousand people come to get vaccinated. Remember, it, it, it comes in that kind of uh, the groups of 1,000 doses or 500 doses. So it has to be a place where you can do a lot of um, vaccinations. It's not going to be in small communities. But that will eventually get there, and there are other vaccines on the horizon. How do we decide which vaccine to get if more than one is approved by the FDA? Really great question. Uh, <laughs> right now, my feelings give me anything. I'll take the first one. Uh, with the 95% efficacy, I mean, that's really great, but it's two shots. Uh, if there's one that comes out that's one shot and it's easier to distribute later, I think that will be one that probably takes over uh, from the ones currently. They're harder to store and to require two shots. Uh, remember, it's hard enough to get people to do one, but sometimes it's, and if it requires two, that's going to be a challenge. The best thing is to check with your physician. There will be some that are better for kids, some that are better for the elderly. There'll be ones that are easier to give. There'll be ones that we can get to, you know, under-resourced communities or rural communities better. But I would rely on the physicians uh, in the community to make those decisions. All right, now to treatment questions, and these are always fun. A uh, good question, is convalescent serum effective? Well, we sort of covered that a few weeks ago. Uh, we'd had great hopes for convalescent serum. There was a, a study in India, a large study, that showed that uh, when given to mo moderate to severe cases, it didn't have a benefit. That's probably because you need to give it early. The monoclonal antibodies that are being given as infusions now from Pfizer and others, they're only effective early in, in the disease. So maybe convalescent serum will be found to be useful early on, but it has not been as effective as we had hoped. Uh, why do we not need as many ventilators as we did in the beginning? Really great question. I think the medical community has learned a lot. <laughs> what we learned is that keeping people off ventilators is better to treat them. Uh, and before, we didn't have anything to treat them with. So now we have remdesivir and we have dexa uh, dexamethasone, which keep people off ventilators. So we don't need nearly the, nu the number. And we try to keep people off ventilators now when they have a drop in their oxygen rather than put them on because it turns out the combination of having positive pressure ventilation uh, with COVID-19 and uh, SARS-CoV-2 is not a good for your lungs. And that's been a, uh, so we, we try to keep people off ventilators. Okay, now it's about tests. Should we avoid the rapid test? I understand it's only 50% reliable. Which test is most reliable? So the, the, the most reliable test is a PCR test. Uh, that is a definitive diagnostic test. These antigen capture tests that, you know, you can do in 15 minutes. Uh, if you do serial, they're, they're, first of all, they don't catch everybody, so they're not as sensitive. So if, you, if 10 people have the disease, it'll only pick it up in 6 of 10. So if you do serial testing in your family or in a, in a community or an institution, you'll, you'll pick up somebody, you know, if, after two or three times doing it, if you're doing it daily. But it's not definitive. And even then, I would get a PCR to, to test it. Best example of those not being helpful is the White House. The White House was using antigen capture assays, 15-minute quick test, and everybody got infected because all it takes is missing one to infect a bunch of people. 
So it's not the best way, but let, let me say, though, there's new technologies coming out uh, for quick tests. What we need is a reliable quick test that's relatively cheap, cheap and easy to administer. That would solve a lot of our problems uh, in schools and colleges. So if we could get one, that would be great. Hopefully we'll have a vaccine and we won't need it as much. Um, is good question. Is reinfection possible after you've confirmed COVID? Yes. So it's not often. Uh, there have been several cases uh, in the literature, three, to, three or four people, very well documented, where a person got infected with COVID, they sequenced the virus, they recovered, and then a person got infected again with a different, they were able to tell it was a new infection because it's a slightly different sequence. So that was clearly a second infection. Now, in most of those cases where it's been documented, they have a milder case. So it's almost like they had, they were immunized first, they had a milder case. But there have been one or two reports of people dying after being infected a second time. We hope that the vast majority of people, it doesn't happen because we're hoping the vaccine gives you immunity for at least a year, two years. Uh, and, and we think that's what happens with natural infection too. But it does happen occasionally. I don't think it's as big a deal as people have been talking about it. Okay, here's a good one. Why can you still test positive even when you've waited out the 14 day period? Good question, a really good question. So. When, you, when we do the swab and we pull out, you know, the virus, that, we think that virus is infectious because you've got the disease, you're infectious. And we, what we amplify is the genetic material in the virus. We actually amplify the RNA and we can detect that. Then you, you develop antibodies yourself, you fight the virus off and the antibody begins to kill the virus. And there's a bunch of dead viruses lying around, but they're, they're still present. Their bodies, their bodies are laying on the battlefield. When you stick that swab up there again, you pull it out, you do the PCR, we can still detect the RNA, but it doesn't mean that that virus is infectious. And in fact, uh, most of the time it is not infectious. Now there, there have been examples of people who after being infected shed virus, real virus for three, four weeks at a time. But it's so un unusual that we j we've even stopped doing the PCR test because very often you will be positive. We just say, stay out for 14 days. You should not be infectious after that time. And then we, we bring you back into the workplace. So, but that's why it's, it's seeing dead soldiers lying around the ground. It's not that they're active viruses necessarily. So is there another good question, any evidence of long-term impacts of COVID-19? So, we really don't know, and, and, and we're, but we, we suspect uh, there are going to be problems with lung disease. There's some evidence of cardiovascular disease with cardiomyopathies. Remember, the virus enters through the respiratory tract, but it's a systemic infection. And I, we've talked a lot in the different um, uh, videos about the receptors, the ACE2 receptor that's all over blood vessels, and the neuropillin receptor. It's in the olfactory bulb and in the brain and in nerves. There are cognitive disorders. People have had strokes. So the big concern is that there will be problems uh, post-COVID with, you know, from having this disease. That's why, one, it's another example why the concept of letting it run rampant through the entire United States to develop herd immunity that way is crazy because it might give us a, a huge price tag of taking care of secondary complications for the rest of people's lives. So uh, as best that we can tell, there are gonna be complications. We don't know them all, but it's gonna be the subject of a lot of studies and a lot of follow-up. Again, evidence why it's best not to get infected. Uh, other topics, uh, could, could the U.S. Uh, patients in COVID be, for COVID be worse off because we're in worse health? Yes, we have had a higher mortality and I think there is some, some truth to that. You know, I, I did mention some of the genetic risk factors though that also play a, a role, uh, whether it's this response, interferon responses, the Neanderthal alleles. There are a lot of, there's a lot of genetic reasons why people might be at, at higher risk. The Neanderthal allele, remember I mentioned, was in Bangladeshis, 50% in Bangladeshis. They have twice the mortality of uh, the other uh, ethnic groups in the United Kingdom. And so that has nothing to do with what comorbid disease they have. It has to do with their genetic response to the disease. So um, anyway, that's very interesting. Uh, so there's uh, another person asked, uh, there's an article in us from Australia that said they discovered a virus could stay active on surfaces for over 20 days. Uh, should I still leave my gr gr groceries in the gar garage for a day? 
So I, I don't do any of that. I think just wash your hands. I, I mean, the main thing is it, fomite transmission has been a, a lot lower. Fomites are things where the virus is on stuff, you know, on surfaces. That's called, any, any surface that gives the virus to you is a fomite. So that, that is very common. It was very common with SARS-1. You know, a lot of people touched the elevator button in, uh, in Singapore and got sick. This is, this is different. We, that has not been the main way of spread. It's been mostly aerosol. So I don't keep my groceries out. I don't wipe off the outside, but I do wash my hands. So just, I would continue to, I would behave normally, but wash your hands. Don't, you know, if you're handling stuff, wash your hands before you touch your face. And I wouldn't leave uh, groceries in a garage for a day unless you want to attract bears or uh, raccoons. Uh, I have read that the coronavirus is muta mutating. Is that true? Okay, so these RNA viruses do mutate fairly slowly. Uh, HIV mutates all the time. This one fairly slowly. There have been three major strains. The original one uh, in Wuhan that was, you know, from bat to pangolin to Wuhan. That was the, the, the original strain. It had a certain thing. There was, then there was a mutation that was in one amino acid in the spike protein that stabilized it and put more spike proteins all over the place. And that became the dominant strain in most of China and Italy and Europe. And then that's the strain that's in the U.S. There has been not a lot of mutations since. I anticipate there will be some. But so far, the mutations aren't to the point that it really train, you know, changes it so much that it would avoid the vaccine. In contrast, flu mutates dramatically. And that's why every year we have to have a different flu vaccine. HIV mutates so much that even your antibodies can't keep up uh, with the changes in the envelope protein. But this is, is, doesn't mutate so fast that we can't manage it so far. Uh, now, here's a really important question. Is it safe to get routine health screening and have elective surgery like knee replacements during the pandemic? Absolutely. One of the biggest problems with the pandemic is it scared people away from getting routine health care. So we don't want to have people have a uh, missed cancer, a breast cancer, a missed GI cancer because they didn't go to the doctor. There's lower transmission in hospitals and in doctor's office than there is in the community. You're safer going to the hospital than hanging around the grocery store. So I would no longer, I would, I would get all your elective surgeries done. I would get all of your routine care done, but you gotta do it in a place that you feel comfortable with, that you know, manages social distancing, whereas you, know, you have your mask on and, and, and the medical facilities are all doing this. As I say, it's safer to go into the hospital these days than to go in, into the grocery store. So that was all I had. Uh, what a wonderful, <laughs> what a wonderful week. Uh, we all need some time off. Have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Uh, I look forward to, to seeing everybody uh, in the future. One thing we do every year that I wanted to point out was the, um, we work with the Hess Company. Uh, and ever since I was a little kid, every, every year at Christmas, they come out with a Hess truck. These are the coolest toys ever. They're actually collector's items. And we have partnered with the Hess Company now for several years because, only, in, only at Baylor College of Medicine, our middle school uh, physics teachers and science teachers came up with a STEM curriculum to use with your Hess truck. Experiments you can do to teach you STEM education uh, it, with using the Hess truck. And so we co-brand that. We, we published the, the, the book, uh, the, the lessons that are free to teachers online. Uh, Hess gives away the trucks and we have been doing that for several years to our middle school. So thank you to the Hess Corporation. We really appreciate it. Uh, thank you to our faculty members working to educate our kids in STEM uh, and have a wonderful holiday season. Uh, and I will see you next week. Thank you.